can't sucks. smell. He has a headache. No, it's weird. I could smell. I, I had COVID what three doing. times. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, that's what I would tell people too. I I'm the king one of, of COVID. one of the worst. Yeah. Uh, I met this woman a few days ago, actually, when I was out uh, with Joe Kent in Washington, mm-hmm. and she had COVID. And a year later, she still has no taste. A year later. Really? A year later. John, my media guy, Did, has no taste. What is she? Like is she like wearing outcome. a lot of like like leopard print and stuff like that? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of gold and leopard yeah, print. No, no. God. <laughs> her, her, her fashion sense. Is just oh, fine. okay, okay, okay. Right, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're being very specific. <laughs> How was that with Joe? Man? Like, hey. oh, it was great. Yeah. It was really great. You know, he and I had spoken on the phone. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, a guy who's uh, soon to be a CW5 here in a few days was his senior. Um, they served together. And he's the one who told me about Joe Kent a few months ago. I didn't, right. I didn't really wasn't tracking who he was, mm-hmm. what he was doing. But uh, we spent two days out on the road. We did like four or five town halls a day together. Wow. And traveled through his district in like the most populated areas, the most rural part of his district. And uh, he's just a phenomenal human. He is. Washington's such a weird, it's weird for me because that's like salt of the earth kind of uh, terrain. Like I feel when I'm in Washington, when I'm in P&W, it's one of my favorite places in the country. Same. But when I'm near Seattle, dude, it's bad. Like Seattle's (laughs) like really bad. I think when crime was up, well, crime is up um, big time across the board. But in August of this year, they had more murders Than they've ever recorded since the recording of murders in the in the city and state's wow. history, mm. which is dumbfounded because I'm like, well, this is the epicenter of all these issues, and it's such a beautiful place outside. I was with the That's buddy Craig Anderson, and then people have told me about Joe Kent, and they're like, likely he's not going to win. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why is it likely that he's not going to win? He's the right guy. <laughs> he's su- people think he's like fringe right. No. He's actually super moderate. Compared to like what you could be yeah. on the common fringe. Sense. I yeah, think that's the thing is, mm-hmm. is, you know, the term moderate has gotten such a stigma mm-hmm. for people who hold really strong views mm-hmm. on whatever issue. And they, they think of someone who's moderate and they think like, you're lukewarm, you're just riding the middle road. Right. But somebody like Joe Kent, um, I, I related to him a lot because we're hard to categorize into. Right one specific political label or another because it's just like okay it's common sense and yeah there are some things i feel really strongly about and uh i think he definitely falls in that category and what's so awesome about him is he's just um he speaks the truth yeah and he doesn't care who it's going to piss off he speaks the truth and he stands up for what he believes in and and he knows what he's fighting for which yeah. can't be said for a lot of folks right yeah moderate's like conservative now you're just a conservative. Yeah. You're moderate. Right. right. Yeah. It, yeah. You're just. Well, I, and and the other thing is, is it's interesting how they've divided the the conservative side. Well, I mean, they're all dividing each and every yeah. portion of this specifically for you know conversation or gaslighting or whatever mm-hmm. it is because there's like MAGA and ultra MAGA and like now they're like subdividing the MAGA. They are. And you're like, well, you're ultra MAGA. What, what, I don't even know what that means. I like, don't know, but they have the shirts and the hats. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> but you, you can be like MAGA curious, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe there's like, you know, maybe that's like, uh, uh, I don't know how you would classify that. But I think that's part of the problem. And this is, this is uh, one of the things I've been talking about just as I've been on the road is like, people are trying to ask me now. They're like, well, how do we, like, where do we put you? What box do you fit in? What do we mm. call you? Like, I'm an American and I love this country. That's what right. you can call me. Yeah. Period. Full stop. It's it's all of these labels within both parties mm. and across the spectrum that really are there to divide us and, you know, make us forget that, hey, this is our country. We're all Americans. We got to figure this shit out. Mm. Well, I think it's interesting because I actually love being able to take a position where... I'm passionate, um, relatively, let's say, articulate in speaking about it, or I have an experience with an issue. Yeah. I like being able to choose on the topic and discussion and not being able to look at what the party affiliation is mm-hmm. and just kind of look at it exactly. and then unpack the problem mm-hmm. and then talk about it. I don't really talk about, you know, obviously detailed politics a lot on the show, but I don't like being categorized as a conservative exactly. or a liberal or uh, in some parts of the internet, a cuck, 
but I, uh, <laughs> which is funny <laughs> because I donated to her campaign exactly. and I took like a the lot of shit. Of yeah. Hurt. Which was. And look where we are now. And, and look where we are exactly. now, which, which is fine. Like I, you know, which I, even, I really respect. I, I respect that. That because was the first not, time we talked. It was, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure I apologized to you. For that. Oh, I know. And I was like, what are you talking about? I don't give a shit. Like, who cares? Yeah. You know, uh, and because I, I loved, and it was when you were uh, when you were holding the Clinton political establishment accountable yeah. in the debates, one, I said, what, I mean, I, I probably said something like, less articulate and something I don't want to repeat in in front of you here, but I was like talking about the size of cojones or something. I was like, that is legit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because knowing enough about the Clinton political establishment and knowing like that's your death sentence. Like I was Literally. looking at it going, oh my God, yeah. you're trying to hold them accountable on the in the in the international stage. Yeah. One, that takes so much courage. Two Everybody knows it's true yes. and they just don't say anything out of fear. So That's the right. courage is also directly elevated. And then three, how do I put another coin in that jukebox? Because right. I want to hear that <laughs> tune again. I was like, yeah. this is so incredible. The amount of courage that it took to do that. Uh, I, I was just kind of blown away by it. And you, you, you say there was a death sentence and uh, I had members of Congress coming up to me, Democrats, mm -hmm. who literally were saying, that was courageous and bye, because yeah. you are done. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them saying like, you will never get off their shit list. Yep. And this was, this was actually back when she was running for president mm -hmm. and I was holding her to account because nobody else was on her record saying, right. everybody was saying like, oh, you know, She's the most qualified person ever to run for president and all of this experience and all this stuff. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Are you kidding me? She wants to be the commander in chief right. of our military. This is her biggest weakness for all of these very specific reasons that have to do with her record. Mm. Nobody was willing to say it. So once I stepped out and, and really spent those months leading up to that primary election, drawing attention to that specifically because nobody else was, um, people were coming up and just saying like, you know, she's going to win. She's going to be the president of the country. Uh, your political career is absolutely done. Right. As a member of Congress, you will not be able to get a single penny for your district in Hawaii because that's how they operate. They don't forget. And there is a physical list. And this guy told me he supported Barack Obama over Hillary like early in 2008. Right. He's, uh, God, what was this? This was like 2000... Um, yeah, I guess it was 2016. Uh, he said, I only I only just got back into acceptable graces with the Clinton machine that many years later. And uh, it was like, you know, I laughed at these things because it really just revealed so much about them, uh, yeah. both the Clintons and also these people who are elected leaders in our country who mm -hmm. really aren't at all. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to ma – making fear-motivated decisions right. rather than standing on principle or – um, just, just speaking the truth. Mm. What, what was the turning point for you to kind of step outside of the party and communicate that, Hey, you were walking away. Was there one specific moment? Was there a, a deliberate plan? Like what's the incentive for you to actually do that? Cause it seems like the more you do that, the more you're going to be analyzed and assessed and back into the, the the wheels the grinds of politics yeah what why, why are you doing that and why are you doing that now it just it, it wasn't a um you know there wasn't like a specific moment day or time or thing it has been uh i think kind of a, a slow build over time especially over these last few years uh seeing example after example of the Bi both the Biden administration, but also the, really the leaders of the Democrat Party, mm -hmm. things have been going in the wrong direction for mm -hmm. a while. Yeah. I spent time as a vice chair of the DNC and as a member of Congress, like even running for president, standing on the debate stage and saying, hey, we got to fix the Democratic Party. I'm running to fix this party, right. to keep us out of nuclear war, to bring us back to our roots of the party of JFK, the party of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, the party of the people. And I was excoriated for having the audacity to say like, hey, the Democratic Party is broken. Right. Um, 
fast forward through, you know, 2020 to where we are today. And um, ultimately, it comes down to the leaders of the Democrat Party. They're against freedom mm. in every way. And the party that I joined 20 years ago was once the big tent party that said, hey, you and I can have like really strong disagreements on any issue, mm -hmm. really, uh, with health care, immigration, whatever the case may be. But as long as we stand under this tent of like, hey, we're we are fighting for the people, we are the people's party, then we're good. That is not the case anymore. Mm. Um, they are very much the party of the elite. They are very much the party of 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 having this arrogant, condescending attitude mm -hmm. that unless you believe in what, unless you not only believe in, but go out on the street and hold a sign and scream at the top of your lungs in support of whatever their issue or narrative of the day is, then you're canceled, you're smeared, you are not welcome uh, in, in their presence. And uh, ultimately it came down to, you know, the fundamental issues of freedom in the Constitution and how in almost every respect they are doing everything they can to undermine those fundamental freedoms. And, and, the, it, it, and the Democrat Party has become the war party. Those are the two big things that ultimately drove me to, to make that decision and to walk away. Um, you know, I was getting asked all the time because I've, I've been calling them out for a while. People are like, why are, why are you still a Democrat? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Why are you still a Democrat? Right. And, and so it took, um, <clears throat> I, I could not have that letter next to my name mm. anymore. And that's what it came down to. I saw a statistic that said 60% um, of the country identifies as independents now yeah. based on the two-party system. But everybody would tell you like, hey, to succeed in winning an election, you have to be affiliated with a party because mm -hmm. you have to get their buy-in, whether it's lobby whether it's you know funding, wh whatever it is, whatever mechanisms, mm -hmm. to, you have to earn their support. But you're calling yourself an independent, right? You're not. Yeah. You're not affiliating with no. right or, mm -hmm. or specifically left. No. Interesting. Um, do you think you would ever? Uh, I think a lot of people tap dance around this, but I'm interested in it. Do you think you'd ever run for president again? Um, I don't know. Is the honest answer. Uh, obviously, I've been through it, and I've seen, uh, I've seen the the reality of the kind of the dark underbelly of, of national politics, presidential politics, uh, have a very clear-eyed view of what it would t take mm -hmm. uh, to run and actually win. I, I would do it if I felt that I could actually um, make a difference in, for example, the situation that we're facing right now with uh we're at the brink of nuclear war. Yeah. That's with scary. Russia. Yeah. Yeah, it's super That's scary. the reality. Mm -hmm. And it is the existential threat that th it's the greatest existential threat we face. You hear these guys talk, oh, it's climate change, it's this, it's that. It's like we are staring down the barrel of a nuclear warhead right, right. now, or over 6,000 of them, actually. Nobody's paying attention to it. No. They're not paying attention to it. Politicians are ignoring it. The media is ignoring it. And, and maybe even more dangerously, when they do talk about it, they talk about it as though it's just like, you know, uh, as though it is a war that can be won. Mm -hmm. And actually using those terms and saying, oh, well, if we just use tactical nukes or a little nuke here or a little nuke there, right. as though that's not going to spark off uh, nuclear war. It will. And, you know, I, you know, I, everywhere I go when I talk about this, I point to President Reagan and President Kennedy, mm -hmm. two presidents from different political parties at different times who both understood the seriousness of this threat and who both uh, exercise the kind of leadership that our country needs right now mm -hmm. to walk us back from the brink. Um, I pray that I pray that we will not get to a point of no return under this administration. We got two years left. It's why I'm out there helping good people get elected to Congress to try to get a check right. on the administration's power. Um, but those are the things that are on my mind. Uh, in answer, in answer to your question, you um, so you have a military background and experience. And me and Evan talked about how we wanted to talk to you on this podcast and not make it political because I, I honestly don't think either one of us are very political. Yeah, we dabble. I'm. I mean, I am. I'm. I'm yeah. political. You know, I'm, I'm. I would say I'm more controversial at times than I am political because of yeah. what I do. You know, in the context of, I don't care. You yeah. know, and you believe I'm you not believe. I'm not going to conform to a narrative because everybody expects me to be in this party. 
It's like if I'm going to call right is right and wrong is wrong or my opinion, I'm not going to be afraid of the internet. I don't give yeah. a fuck what they have to yeah. say. Yeah. Like, who cares? Like, yeah. I won. At the end of the day, it's like I have an awesome business with people that I care about. Like, yeah. dude, who cares what some guy or person mm-hmm. is in their in their basement talking about? I don't mm-hmm. care. But I'm not going to limit my experiences in life or what I'm thinking about or my opinions based on what somebody else says. Yeah. yeah. Now, I can have interactions with people and have legitimate disagreements. I can sit on the other side of, a, of, a, of an agreement and clearly articulate my feelings or my experience or my intelligence referencing the subject. And I don't have to like the person, but I can also like people that I disagree with. Yeah. And that's the difference. Mm. It is. In our, the complexity and nuance of being a human in our communication is not limited to Instagram and left or right. Mm-hmm. You can't convey a complex theory, thought, or anything relative in the human experience in Twitter or in social media. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. So I always look at it. I'm like, you know, I'm more controversial, but and I am political in the context of I have obviously my opinions in it, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's like I'm not gonna. Oh, I can't say that, or I can't say this. Can't like, be I don't seen care. with that person. Yeah, I can't be seen with yeah. that person. It's like courage is something I think every leader defines themselves with. Mm-hmm. If you don't have courage, you're not a leader. It That's doesn't right. matter. That is the primary component of leadership. Yeah. It's courage. Yeah, yeah. So when I see courageous people. I don't care what their political affiliation is. It's like, oh, that's, man, that's legit. Mm-hmm. When you when you see it, you know, you have to respect it. Mm-hmm. I do. I, mean, I know I, that's at least I my agree. thought. No, mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, because I think I, I take from your experience and all the things that you learned in Congress mm-hmm. and then coming out and stepping away that you take things like a military leader. Mm-hmm. I, I We've had this conversation before, but... I get the sense that when you make decisions or you have deep dives and, and then you go against the party, for mm-hmm. example, it's because you're assessing information yep. and then making the decision based off that information. Yep. And a lot of people, so you can't be biased when you're trying to target Al Qaeda mm-hmm. and you're trying to navigate no. all these complex issues. So it seems like that's the take and whether that's independent or that's mm-hmm. just you being you, that's super important. What, what is your military experience? Like, wh- where did, like I, I'm curious myself, Personally, I didn't even look this up yeah. because I wanted to know where you come from militarily yeah. and then and then if that correlates to the experience that yeah. you're having now. Um, I've always been an independent-minded person. Mm. Um, fourth of five kids, born in American Samoa, raised in Hawaii, three older brothers. And, you know, my parents raised us with, with a, a, you know, a strong set of values that are centered around service and God. Mm. And... Basically, they just said, look, to all of us, do whatever you want in your life. It's your life. We're not going to tell you you have to go to college or you have to do this. Or you have to get this degree or title or whatever. It's your life. Um, know that whatever you choose to do, if you dedicate that path uh, in service, you'll be happy. Mm. And that that's the definition of success in life. And so, you know, even um, they let us make bad decisions and let us learn from them didn't try to con- you know control right. us in any way and and so just being raised with kind of that hey think this problem through yourself weigh the pros and the cons come to your own conclusion and they may not agree with it but it's again help you know we're working through that so so just being raised in that kind of environment um i think really set that foundation of just being an independent thinker going through and assessing every you know whether it's a policy or, or a life decision for mm-hmm. that matter um, really looking at it carefully before taking a step uh, in a certain direction. And that was only further. Um, uh, so I, I was uh, serving in the state house. Mm-hmm. I was elected in 2002. I was 21, very passionate about wow. protecting the environment, which was kind of the thing that drove right. me to get involved in politics. Never once thought, okay, well, I'm going to be a politician now for the mm-hmm. rest of my life at all. It was at that moment there was an opportunity, there was an open seat, and um, you know we I I was like helping out with these uh, 
I'd formed an environmental nonprofit. We successfully stopped a landfill from being built over a water, one of our three major water aquifers wow. on the island. And uh, the reason why, it, it basically, it was getting um, kind of rubber stamped through the process because the guy, the landfill guy, was a big donor for the Senate president, the state Senate president. And so it was just like, hey, let's backdoor this thing through. And we stopped it. And for me, as a young person, that was a really impactful moment to see, like, oh, wow. So we, the people, are actually pretty powerful right. when we exercise our voice and go out and just say, no, corrupt politician, we're not going to let you contaminate and poison our water source. Uh, and so that's where I, when, I, when I ran for office, um, that was the driving factor there. Were you in Were you in college at the time? Because you're twenty one. I had taken. I I had gone to community college mm -hmm. first, and I was uh, actually studying like TV and film production, mm -hmm. um, behind the camera and learning all all of that is it's kind of what I was interested in wanted to do. I'd taken a break. I'd helped my mom run for board of education, and then at that point, I was trying to decide. Okay, am I am I going to go back to school? Um, and then this thing came up, and I was like, Well, I can go talk about it in a classroom, or I can go do it. And knowing like it whether I win or lose the race, I will do my best and, and it'll be a win-win outcome no matter what. And uh, it was a five-way um, open primary, every one of us running for the first time. And I won the primary election, uh, knocked on thousands of doors, which was, and then waved signs during rush hour traffic, um, spent the least amount of money of any campaign in the entire state, had because I had none. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, had to learn how to, you know, went to Ross and like got adult clothes and not surf <laughs> shorts and slippers and <laughs> Ross dress for less. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. man. Ten dollar pants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually had to wear shoes. <laughs> Just a thing in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I uh, was getting into the uh, I enlisted in the, the Army National Guard after uh, really motivated by what happened on 9-11. Mm -hmm. Took my oath of office on the House floor, shipped out to basic training once our legislative session was done at Fort Jackson. Um, asked, uh, the, I told the recruiter, I was like, I got this limited amount of time that I can be gone before I got to come back to the legislative session. And I was going into a medical unit. I was like, you just got to give me a job that has the, the shortest AIT. Cause right. yeah. I, you know, I, I would have probably gone in to do something else. But anyway, uh, that was what happened next year. 2004, I was campaigning for reelection when our uh, Hawaii Guard uh, Brigade combat team was activated to go to Iraq. And it was the first um, it was really the first deployment for that brigade combat team since Vietnam. And so for just about everybody up and down the chain of command, it was their first trip. Right. Um, I was somebody else was already had already filled that line number for the job that I was trained in. And so my commander called and he's like, Hey, congrats. You don't have to go. Uh, you can go finish your reelection, do your job here. You know, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll be back in 18 months. And I just told him, there's no way, there's no way I'm going to stay here and watch you guys go. Right. And so they had another vacancy, got trained in a different job. And, um, that deployment, uh, we were in Iraq, uh, yeah, about a year. We had like a mm -hmm. four month train up and, I mean, it, it for me, it just changed everything as far as my worldview. You know, growing up in Hawaii, I didn't spend a lot of time, maybe if at all, thinking about foreign policy or, you know, what what people in Washington were doing. Um, being exposed to, obviously, the direct cost of war there in a human sense. Right. But also just like, you know, you guys remember seeing KBR Halliburton stamped on mm. everything. Everything. And making friends with, you know, the the third country nationals from, you know, Sri Lanka and the right. Philippines and Nepal. And coming from Hawaii, we had a lot of Filipinos, you yeah, know. Yeah. And it, so they would go in, like, the back of the tent with, with the Filipinos who were there contracted for KBR. And they would cook and bring out the rice cookers and, like, you know, as we do anywhere we go. But just making friends with them and just saying, like, how much do you get paid? How often do you get to go home and see your families? Right. And knowing then uh, and learning more when I got back how much money KBR was making right. and how these people were basically like almost slave labor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Almost slave and labor. And thought it was a good deal. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They get whatever, 600 bucks a month. Right. And they get to go home like, you know, a week once a year, yeah. if that. Yeah. 
And so, you know, it was a real, it was a learning experience for me in so many ways. And uh, I came back from that wanting to find a way to take that experience and um, do something constructive with it. Mm. And wasn't sure exactly how or where. Ended up uh, working for Senator Akaka from Hawaii, mm-hmm. who was the chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee in the Senate at the time. And so went to Washington for a couple of years. Uh, I was enlisted during that first deployment, went through OCS, and then volunteered for a second deployment uh, where I uh, was able to go as a platoon leader. And um, learned a lot during that deployment. Came back again, just trying to figure out where am I supposed to be? You know, where can I be that I can actually make an impact uh, on foreign policy, on the military, on veterans issues? The answer to that wasn't very clear. I ended up running for and getting elected to city council, and then there was a, an open seat in Congress, and, and uh, it was an impossible. People who said, uh, Tulsi, we like you, we think you're great, but there's absolutely no way you can win this race because there's another guy running. He is the guy. He's got all the endorsements. He's got all the support. Everybody knows who he is. Nobody knows who you are. You don't have any money. You don't have any backing. Why don't you try again in like 20 years? Right. And um, I, I knew in my heart why I needed to do this. And, um, and so I just, I just started. It's like trying to figure it out. Try to figure out I had, all right, I got to raise over a million dollars. Got to raise $1.3 million in order to get across the finish line. Had never, no concept of what that would take at all. Um, but, uh, we ended that's, that's exactly what I ended up raising. It's exactly what we ended up needing. Five months before election day, I was, um, polling at 25%. The front runner was pulling at 65%. Wow. I had gone from 3% to 25. So I was right. feeling pretty good about myself. Uh, but focusing completely on applying for a job. And I would tell people everywhere I went, whether it was a big town hall or sitting in someone's living room, as I'm applying a, for a job from you, you will be my boss if you choose to send me to Washington. I am accountable only to you. And, um, so on election night, when we, when we won, uh, I ended up winning by a 22% margin. Whoa! It was a total blowout. Everybody was shocked. The guy who was the front runner, he had, you know, months before the election, he was interviewing his future staffers already, completely taking me for granted, completely taking for granted the reality, which is, hey, it's people, it's the voters who actually get to make this decision not all the the chambers of commerce and the unions and all of these fancy politician type people who he had whose support he had he forgot the most important thing and uh i didn't and i never ever ever forgot that you know it's it it's interesting looking back on and hearing your story as far as like it's the underdog yeah all do you still Every time. feel like you're just the perpetual underdog and that people are taking you for granted and wow, you're going to open their eyes. Um, you know, I, I don't, I've never, I've never looked at it that way no. in the sense, I mean, it, it has been the case, right? but I have never, um, I guess the, the approach and the mindset that I've had is, you know, I'm cert I've, I've certainly chosen the path less traveled every time. Mm-hmm. Um, but knowing, uh, having my priorities straight and not like, you know, the, the Democratic Party's never backed me, whether mm-hmm. the state level or the national level for anything. And cool. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you know, and, and so it, it kind of just goes back to um, be stand, standing with my own feet firmly on the ground, standing, not bending the knee. Right. And, uh, being very clear eyed about, you know, why I'm doing this and who I'm doing it for. And, um, so that by like de facto has made me kind of the, the underdog and kind of the, the outlier. Um, but I, I honestly, I wouldn't have had it any other way. When you think back about your experience in the military and, you know, obviously as an enlisted person and now, yeah. you know, you're still in, right? Yeah. I'm in the reserves. Yeah. Um, it, what's your rank? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, 
I was thinking major, but you must have been. When I was were you promoted, promoted? Uh, last year, actually, when I was oh. overseas. On the 4th of July, it was pretty cool. Oh. That's awesome. I'm sorry yeah. I didn't congratulate you then, but I'm congratulating <laughs> you now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and how impactful has your military experience been in the way that you lead and the way that you look at leadership today? Yeah, it, it has shaped um, it has shaped who I am in so many ways, and it has absolutely shaped the kind of leader I strive to be every day. Um, you know, being a platoon leader was the best job that I had. Being responsible for those guys and girls um, every day, it was it was a tough situation. Uh, it was a pretty toxic leadership environment outside our platoon. That's it's a. It's a long story we can save for another time, but all of that is to say um, my my real learning began there. You know, even OCS. OCS is a great leadership school. Mm. That's what I took away from that. Uh, whenever kids ask me, should I go through ROTC or whatever, obviously I'm biased. Like OCS is a very intense leadership school that start, you know, gives you kind of just the basic ABCs of of how to think and the responsibility that you carry you know, how to analyze a problem set and figure out, you know, what are the possible courses of action, you know, making sure you have a clear achievable objective, making sure you've got a way out, being able to define success and victory, kind of these very basic things. Um, and, and I've taken that with me and applied it uh, directly to my service in Congress. And it, it has been so interesting over the years how, you know, I was on the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee for almost the entire time I was in Congress. And so, you know, we'd get, like, people from, you know, we'd get the Secretary of Defense, we'd get right. the Secretary of State, we'd get, you know, the four stars coming through. And um, so often, and I know you guys know this, but so often when I would ask these very simple questions, like, why aren't we going after, like, our objective in... Syria, for example, is to go after Al Qaeda, right? Mm -hmm. Go after ISIS. And uh, so why aren't we doing it? And I remember the answer I got back from Secretary Mattis was, well, Congresswoman, it's complicated. Like, hmm. Mm. Okay. Right. <laughs> but it was period. It wasn't, well, it's complicated and here's this and that and this and that. Right. The, the, my line of questioning at that point in time, just as an example, was... You know, it it was the backdrop of why I introduced the Stop to, uh, Stop Arming Terrorists Act, which you'd think, why in the world would we need to do that? Well, they were arming Al yes. Nusra, mm -hmm. aka Al Qaeda, in right. Syria because they were the most lethal fighting force, effective to go after the regime, mm -hmm. which was really the objective all along. Right. That they refused to say out loud, even though it was very obvious that was the case. So, all, all of that is to say. Um, my military experience and background, both at a personal level but also at a professional level, allowed me to be able to ask the kinds of questions that a lot of members of Congress don't even know to ask. Right. And so they're susceptible to the kind of filibustering and wordplay that we hear from both high-level civilians and uniformed people from the Pentagon who come in with, obviously, their own objectives, uh, withholding the information that they don't want Congress to know about, um, and tap dancing around very direct questions uh, that they should be answering uh, because they are, I mean, Congress. Congress's job is oversight, but they can't oversee things that, that they don't know. Right. And if you don't know the questions to ask, then you'll never know mm -hmm. because they won't volunteer that information. Well, I think that was, that was one of the most important questions that needed to be asked and yeah. explained in detail to the people at the time. Yeah. Because I know that was a, a, a prominent discussion point with with us, mm -hmm. which was this this seems wrong. Yeah. We we discussed it a lot. And there were guys that left the profession because of the moral quandary. Wow. So when we look at the guys that we were fighting, yep. and then we're, we were doing that for several years in Iraq, mm -hmm. we're pursuing them to all ends of the earth. I mean, at that point, it was, uh, I mean, I think JSOC had international unilateral authority at that point to pursue terrorism across any state line. And I, I could be, I'm, I'm, I'm roughly yeah. uh, on point on that. 
and that was the mission. And then looking at the way things were shifting and how we were arming, training, and then sending, uh, we knew it was happening. Mm-hmm. And we we're like, why, why, why exactly are we doing this? Yeah. And and because of, um, you know, because the the greater good. Mm-hmm. Okay, so explain to me what the greater good is, exactly. and then why. And you know, well, sen- <laughs> well, Congresswoman, it's complicated. Mm-hmm. That was often the answer mm-hmm. that we would get, and that wasn't enough. No, it's not enough. No. But that that goes sorry to interrupt you, no, but please. that goes back to that condescending elite yes. mindset, whether they're talking to members of Congress or servicemen and women or the American people. It's like, yeah, don't don't you worry your little yeah, brain yeah. about this. Right. Uh, we know what's best. Just trust us. Right. Because obviously they've got a great track record. Mm-hmm. Um, that was so it was I was elected to Congress in November of 2012, sworn in in January of 2013. And it was the summer of 2013 that President Obama said, hey, I'm going to go get authorization from Congress to go to war in Syria. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will never forget, I was, I was filling my gas tank in Hawaii in August of that year. Congress is not in session, usually for the month of August. And this woman came up to me. He had just made the announcement. And she came up to me and grabbed my arm as I'm pumping gas. And she said, Tulsi, my son just got back from Iraq please, please, please don't let them start a new war because I want my son to live. Right. Those conversations kept happening over the next like 24, 48 hours. And uh, we got called back to D.C. early because of this announcement so that we could get the briefings, both open and closed briefings on the Foreign Affairs Committees. Secretary Kerry was Secretary of the State at the time. And they came and, and made President Obama's case mm-hmm. to Congress, which is what's supposed to happen. Um, their answers to these very simple questions of what is our objective? I asked him in an right. open hearing, what is our objective? And I believe it was Secretary Kerry. If not, it was like one of the number twos there, the deputies there. But their message was, well, we're going in, we're not going in to decapitate the regime. Uh, we're not going in uh, with a pinprick. We are aiming to punch them in the gut. I said, okay, so how are you planning for their reaction? Right. Oh, well, we just, we don't think they'll react because it'll be a punch in the gut to send a message. Mm. It's like, hmm, how would you react if someone came up to you and punched you in the gut? Right you would probably hit back, if not directly, maybe at one of your friends. Mm-hmm. They would probably come in, call in some of their friends, knowing that, you know, we have friends too. Tell me how this plays out. And they couldn't answer the question. All they said, well, we don't, we don't think they'll respond. That mm. was literally their answer. Well, we don't think they'll respond. Insane. Absolutely insane. So because they had no answers to these very simple questions that I'd learned to think about and ask mm-hmm. as a second lieutenant. Um, second and third order effects. Exactly. Right. It's that is 100% it. Skill level one task at, Completely. at a senior NCO, yeah. junior officer level. Exactly. Exactly. And so uh, after we got all the information, I thought about it, and then I wrote, uh, I wrote an op-ed basically saying, this is why we should not go to war in Syria and why I'm opposing President Obama's request. Uh, got it published, and within within a few hours, got a call from the White House saying, "How dare you?" It's how dare I what? Right. How dare you, as a Democrat, speak out against your president? Number one and number two, you're from his home state. How dare <clears throat> you speak out against him like this? I I was I was, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was surprised that they so completely missed the message. They completely uh, misread me. Like that moment, that was why I ran for Congress. Right. That, that is exactly why I ran. To be in that room, to be able to make that statement and to help try to stop us from going into yet another quagmire of a war right. where every day we're like, hey, why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. What are we doing? Does this serve our country's national security interests? No, it doesn't. Well, whose interest does it serve then? Why are people, why are we allowing people to be killed and dying and sacrificing for what? And the Obama administration 
in the face of my very thoughtful statement and very reasoned and well-explained statement, how dare you cross your own president? And that, that to me, um, said it all. And also that was the beginning of them realizing like, oh, so she's not just going to be one of these like right. go along, get along people who's just like, okay, well, if the boss says so, then, right. you know, we're going to rubber stamp this. And, and there, there are a lot of other examples of that, um, uh, which again, fulfilled my mission in going to Congress in the first place. For decades, buying a silencer has been difficult. But in 2005, Silencer Central set out to simplify the suppressor buying process. So what happens when you buy from Silencer Central? Well, they help you find the right silencer for you. They handle the paperwork so you don't have to. And they give you a free NFA gun trust so you can share your suppressor. Silencer Central allows you to pay while you wait. They make sure your purchase is carefully prepped, packaged, and protected until the moment you're approved. Once approved, they deliver it straight to your door. So whether you're planning your next hunt or putting together a range day, you'll enjoy every shot you take with Silencer Central, straight to your front door. When you think about the last several years and kind of going against the party line, going against the boss, yeah, um, you understand the professional toll, obviously, at times. Yeah. And then also there's got to be individual in psychological effects too. So how how big of a challenge is that for you? I would say day to day, week to week, month to month. Mm -hmm. Like what's the battle and the debate going on? Internally yes. for me? Yeah, yeah. What's that look like? What's it sound like? Um I I learned quickly that um you know I learned quickly that the things that were mo most important to me in my being there in Washington and in Congress um, were were not the norm. I saw how, you know, I think in the first year that I, I, I got, I, I got a lot of attention when I got elected. Mm -hmm. uh, I think really because of my bio more than anything right. else. And it was unexpected and it was not something I sought out, but as you know, like Vogue magazine called my office and called, talked to my press director, like, oh, we want to do a whole feature on your boss. Mm -hmm. And she came in, I'm like, what? Vogue magazine? Like, this is crazy. Like, this doesn't sound like anything I want to have anything to do with. Right. Like, I don't want them to come in and try to dress me up and be somebody or something that I'm not. And um, anyway, so I had a lot of requirements. I did end up doing it because this is a platform to be able to talk to sure. a lot of people that yeah. I wouldn't be able to reach otherwise. And, um, and so they came and they took a picture of me out with my surfboard in Hawaii, which is like, cool. Like, yeah. That's who I am. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, what I realized as I was going through this and I was just kind of like, okay, taking it one day at a time, how do I maximize this opportunity? I started to get, um, some of my colleagues were like, oh, Tulsi, how come you got, got you got invited to the white house correspondence mm. dinner and I didn't, I've been here for 10 years and you just got here. It's like, Wow that's important to you. Um, those are the kinds of things that I started to notice that mattered more. And it also, um, really showed me that I would be, I would be standing alone in speaking, uh, speaking out on these issues and people who I was friendly with when I first got to Congress, I, I, I very quickly saw who was real and who wasn't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes it's a little hard. You're friendly. You're working with your colleagues, and now they're like, they won't talk to you because right. they see you as toxic or controversial. Literally, I had I had staff of one of the members of Congress tell my staff like, "Oh, I'm I will not allow my boss to add their name to Tulsi's bill because we don't want to be um, uh, associated with her controversy, whatever it was." Right. Um, so. I was really grateful, both in hindsight, but as I was going through this, because I, it, I never got comfortable in Washington, ever. I always felt, I always felt like I was um, a bit of a fish out of water. Uh, and, um, which was good, because I didn't want to be comfortable in that place. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to start feeling like, okay, well, this is my, 
you know, home, this is my norm, these are my people, because that's 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 what's wrong with mm-hmm. Washington. Um, you know, building up the armor of of all the haters in person on TV and on Twitter um, has the positive effect of going inward and for me in in prayer and drawing my strength from within and not from other people's approval or disapproval of me. Um, but really also drawing, going back to my experiences overseas and just recognizing in the most real way how short life is and therefore prioritizing what's most important and who's most important and trying to maximize um, every day. So, yeah, I mean, look, there, there have been moments um, and times along the way where, uh, you know, it's been dark and it's been lonely and, um, you know, you just feel sometimes like the energy is sucked out of you and it, it, uh, it really requires, you know, for me on a daily basis is really intentionally staying grounded, taking that time in the morning, just me to spend time in prayer and with God, taking time to work out and, um, being, remaining very focused on, on my purpose because otherwise, like, man, I'd, I'd be home surfing every day. Right. You know what I mean? Um, it has helped also throughout the years. I, I'm an introvert by nature, and I am happy. Like, if, if I'm given a choice, like, hey, let's go to a party or stay home, I will choose staying home every time. And um, I, think, I think that's also helped because every, you know, whether it's going on TV or going out and giving a speech or whatever, um, it requires work and focus and uh, it's, it's not my comfort mm-hmm. place, I guess. Um, which therefore means like I, I'm not, I can't be complacent uh, in those situations and in that environment, which again, I think is, I think is a good thing. Yeah, I think a lot of in, in DC, a lot of people who move to DC, they want to become career politicians. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Their whole objective is yeah. part of the establishment do their, 20 years plus Mm -hmm. and then there's a whole thing to that and it's it's sad because i feel like a lot of the things that we talk about in the issues that are corrupt corruption um all these people making hundreds of millions of dollars as politicians which is insane to me yeah yeah um that limited terms Mm -hmm. obviously would fix a lot of that but if the people who are making the decisions are lifers then you can't fix that right yeah um do you think the country is ready for a female president like you potentially? I mean, it, w- what's scary to me is like, there's a whole bunch of people on the fringes. The saving grace is I think the majority of the country, call them moderate, call them just in the middle, kind of figuring things out, Yeah, seem like, oh man, like this person makes sense. And I feel like maybe in two, three years, when it comes time for the next election cycle, when people are exhausted, they might go, all right, now it's time for somebody who's just balanced because yeah. this is insane. And yeah. I feel like we're on the tipping point of that, which could be the el- next election cycle. Um, if we've had enough, which I think we're already, we've already had enough. Yeah. Um, and I can't think of anybody else who's going to be able to step up. Mm-hmm. Like I, there's not one person that comes to mind, um, male or female that has the leadership background the experience you do in government and is anti-corruption and establishment who's telling the truth. Yeah. So it's weird because it's like, you're it, and I, who else is it going to be? And I, I got to imagine a lot of this that drives you even to come here um, uh, to help out Mike um, Lee, mm-hmm. to go with Joe Kent, that feels like a responsibility. Like it absolutely it is. obviously is, is a purpose and responsibility. Mm-hmm. Do you think we'll ever get to a point where it's like, you, you know, it, it's, it's going to have to be you. Who else is it going to be? I can't, I, can't, <laughs> I don't know who else is going to be. I, um, yeah. Who, who else do you admire within? I mean, I, I know there's a, probably a laundry list of people that you admire, uh, that are currently in politics or trying to move into the, the, political profession I would say or I don't know if that's the right word but who else do you admire 
There's not a laundry list. Right. There isn't. <laughs> okay. No. Well, really no. I was wrong. <laughs> no. Um, there are there are some great people who are running for office right now, mm-hmm. like Joe Kent, mm-hmm. yep. who I'm really proud to support. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was really easy going and you know doing town halls with him and uh, saying great things about him because they're true. Right. Yeah. Um, he is a phenomenal person. He's just a great, humble servant mm-hmm. uh, who is doing what he's doing because it's his duty. Yeah. Right. It is his responsibility. And those are the kinds of people that we need in leadership mm-hmm. in Washington, both elected and, and uh, appointed and otherwise across the board. People who are, um, it is those unwilling leaders who we need, mm-hmm. uh, not the attention seeking, power grabbing, um, corrupt people who, and, and that's why it's not a laundry list. There are, there are a handful of people that I, I became really good friends with, some of whom are still in Congress in the House mm-hmm. or the Senate. Um, you know, like we start talking about, I don't agree with them on everything, but I know that they are, they have good intention and um, their heart's in the right place and that matters. But, um, there's nobody I can sit here and tell you today. I, mm. I have confidence in to lead our country. Yeah. Mm. I can't think of one. And I, I agree that, um, I hope here, here's what I hope. I agree that people by and large across the board are sick and tired of, of the same old politics that we have, the same old game that we hear every freaking election cycle, yep. politicians coming through saying the same old thing, mm. empty promises. They go back and do whatever they want and, and aren't really held accountable um, there's guys like Mike Lee here, which is why I'm here supporting him. You know, he is a constitutional conservative and we work together in Congress around constitutional issues. Um, and he, he's pissed off people in both parties. And mm. to me, that's a badge of honor because right. <laughs> if you're willing, if you're willing to have mm. the courage to take a stand against your own quote unquote team, that means, you know, you're, you're doing something right. Um, what, what I, so I, I think that people in this country are frustrated with the direction we're headed, very concerned, especially how bad things have gotten over the last couple of years so quickly, whether we're talking about freedom of speech and censorship, uh, big tech, parents' rights in education mm-hmm. with kids. I mean, you know, the border, crime. We were talking about crime in, in places like Seattle. There's so many of these things, inflation, rising gas, like across, literally across right. the board in almost every sector, things are bad and getting worse. What I hope is that in this election and as we go forward, and this is my message everywhere I go is, you know, those first three words, the declaration are we the people. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why they chose those first three words. We the people. It's not those other guys or I'm too busy. Somebody else is going to come in and fix everything. If we're frustrated and angry with the direction things are going, it's up to us. Mm -hmm. If we want change, it's up to us. If we want new leaders, it's up to us because they're not going to fix themselves. Corrupt right. politicians are not going to self-identify and be like, yeah, you know, <laughs> those millions of dollars yeah. that I've made from insider trading, like we'll just like give that to charity and we'll pass a law to make it stop. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not going to happen. Uh, and this is both parties, you know, mm-hmm. there, there's no, there are, uh, there are problems in both parties, problems with leaders in both parties. What I don't know is if people are willing to do what it takes to bring about the kind of change. I hope, I hope that we've gotten to a point where things are getting so bad that, that, um, that we will collectively stand up as Americans to, to bring about the kind of really, really deep change that's needed. Um, but we'll see. I think, I think this election, the next few weeks will be very telling. One of the things I've, I've thought about over the years is that, you know, more so now because of uh, the 900 plus employees that we have is, is, that, is that we, okay? yeah, yeah, of course. course, is we have President's Day off. We've got um, all these different holidays that we have off. And it's kind of an expectation of an employer to, to give people the day off. Right. Some of the most important days that we have as a country are when we go vote That's right. because it defines our country and the meaning like it, it, it's the fiber of our existence yeah. here. How is it that we don't have these national holidays where it's either an expectation, an implied task mm-hmm. or a specified task? Mm-hmm. 
to tell people they have the day off, yeah. to go vote, yeah. to go, this is your day to celebrate being an American exactly. and go cast your vote. I can't help but think there's a reason why. Yeah. They don't want you to. Yeah. They don't want you to. There's no other explanation there's for no it. There's no other expectation. Or because no they just, reason. so it was the latest federal holiday was Juneteenth Day. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's the latest one that was passed. Mm-hmm. There have been others before that. What's well, like National Balloon Day or yeah. whatever they pass? Yeah. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. Like, but federal, but actual federal holidays, federal rather than holidays. just saying like, oh, as an employer, you have to give people four hours to mm-hmm. go and vote. I think that's like that. That is the the current law. Mm-hmm. But um, they have to be national holidays. They do. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I've supported legislation in Congress that would do that. Right. Uh, because it's for all the reasons <laughs> that you just said. Um, it is. And, and so, yeah, I mean, you're asking why, like I, I literally don't have any other expl- explanation other than, um, people in power benefit when it's harder for people to vote. Right. And that's where, you know, I support, Hey, we should, we should have extended voting hours. Mm-hmm. You know, we should be, I mean, frankly, we should be paying people to go and man these polling stations uh, I don't. I think it varies, maybe state by state, but like mm. in Hawaii, they depend on volunteers. Yes, and if they don't have enough volunteers, then they're not opening all of the polling stations, which means it's harder for people to go out on election day and cast their votes. Um, you know, there's there there are uh, uh, election integrity um, changes that need to be made. For example, making sure that we have a paper record of mm-hmm. every vote that's cast, so it can be audited. Um, this was legislation I, I worked on and tried to get get through in Congress. So for all the people who are, you know, again, on both sides, it always depends on on whose side wins or loses. But they're like, oh, this, you know, questioning the results of the election. Do something about it. Right. Make sure that hey, if, if you're using an electronic system, there has to be a voter verified paper record of that so that when the questions come up, it can be audited mm-hmm. and uh, and and ultimately we will have more faith and trust that our voices and votes are being counted as they were cast. So there, I mean, there are very basic common sense things, practical things that need to be done to increase people's confidence Mm -hmm. in our democracy and in in our elections. Um, But for all the rhetoric that we hear, they're not doing anything. They're not doing anything about it, which is a problem. It's a it's a big problem. I think it's it, there's a lot of um, hot air that's just there's, kind of like being yep. thrown around. Uh, this insider trading one too is is one of those things. Oh, it you is. You know where you know obviously Pelosi's Family been members. most in the news, but there have been people on both sides <laughs> yeah. who who have benefited to the millions of dollars, whether through their own personal trading or the trading mm-hmm. of their spouse on issues that are directly related to their committee work or information they got from somebody else, and. Um, You know, uh, this was legislation I worked on year after year, refusal to do anything. Even Mm -hmm. now, finally, Nancy Pelosi is the speaker, says, okay, we'll take up legislation. But they still haven't. They still haven't. Well, it's, it's, there's not an incentive there, right? And the people need to push the point. Yeah. And if the people push the point, then obviously there would be a greater incentive than outside interest and individual uh, individual interests. Yep. But I, I like to ask this question because I, I just, I, I, curiosity more than anything, um, you know, profiles and courage. I think you've, it's well used, but when you think of the people that have inspired you throughout the years, whether it's through their action that you've mm-hmm. seen or something that you've read kind of who's inspired you, who's, who's led you, who's, really kind of um, defined some of your leadership characteristics? Uh, that's a great question. In, in politics, um, Senator Akaka, who I worked mm-hmm. for, is the person who stands out the most to me. He um, he was in the dorms at Kamehameha Schools in Hawaii uh, as a young, I don't know how old he was, but uh, he was living in the dorms there at school when they stood on the hillside and the attack on Pearl Harbor happened. Uh, He went on to uh, go into the military. Uh, I believe he was an engineer, Um, served during World War II, came home, became a school teacher for, I don't know, a few decades uh, before he ran for office and was uh, elected to the House of Representatives, the seat that I would later hold, Mm -hmm. and then eventually the U.S. Senate. 
I still who's I, I was talking to Newt Gingrich the other day. He had me on his podcast. Wow, I know Newt, Newt wow. Gingrich. Yeah, and uh, and I was talking about Senator Akaka, and he because he was kind of like you know tell me about your experience right. and that sort of thing. And Newt Gingrich, who was you know he's he's probably been one of the most reviled people by Democrats. Like, oh yeah. Newt Gingrich changed everything and his whole contract, contract with America, with America and yeah. everything, right? It was wonderful. Democrats love to hate him. Yeah, yeah. He sat there. He's like, Tulsi, I remember working with Danny. And Danny was always the most kind, most respectful person. Newt Gingrich had nothing but glowing words for him. And he said he was one of the most effective senators at that time because he treated people with respect. Mm. And because Newt Gingrich, Speaker of the House, knew that Danny Akaka was a guy that he could go and talk to, uh, a man of integrity and whether they ended up agreeing in, on something or disagreeing that he was somebody that you could have a real conversation with mm -hmm. and figure it out. What, what can we do together? And that was, that was, uh, such an incredible, everything that Newt Gingrich said was what I experienced working for him where even, you know, he was the chair of the veterans affairs committee at the time. I was glad to be there because as a, a member of the guard coming home, you know, going through the transition process of, being deployed, coming home, going off of active duty, and now as guard and reservist, being eligible for certain veterans benefits and so on, but not having the support of the active duty, uh, you know, being being on active duty, essentially, right. of being on base and having access to all those things. So anyway, I was able to tell him kind of the gap and the difference between the briefings that they were getting in the committee by the high muckety mucks mm -hmm. in the VA and the DOD, like, oh, we're providing all these great services. I was like, yeah. Here's what that actually looks like. And you're living it. <laughs> right, right. You know, they shoved us all in a tent. Mm -hmm. We're home. All we want to do is go see our families and like back to back briefings. Make sure you sign in so we can tell them that we did this. But, you know, how much value was it really? Anyway, so that that was really um, that was awesome. But even at that time, he as the chair of the committee, he was being undercut by one of his Democrat colleagues who was trying to take his job as the chair of the committee. And we on his team, we were getting kind of pissed off. Like she, this person was playing dirty and um, just saying all, all kinds of horrible things about our boss in in her efforts to take his job from him. And uh, so we went and talked to him one day in his office. We're like, this is what this other senator is doing. It's wrong. Here's what we're proposing to do to fight back. And he just sat back in his chair and he's like, nope, we're not going to do any of that said the best thing that we can do is do our job and that's it she, this other senator is going to say whatever she's going to say um we know why we're doing what we're doing and who we're fighting for and that's what we're going to keep doing and you know it, it's like it's moments like that that's just like whew, teachable moment right teachable moment there um so he's he's still he still stands out to me as uh just a, a principled person who really represented what we in Hawaii call the Aloha spirit, servant leadership, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, there have been different leaders. I, I, I you know, I'd, I'd love to hear what your experience has been, but in the military, I have learned more from uh, poor examples of leadership than I mm -hmm. have seen the rare examples of really, truly amazing leaders. There, there are a couple who I've yeah. had the privilege of working with, but, um, on both the enlisted side and the officer side, but like a couple, uh, you know, going all the way back when I was in E4 during that first deployment, our platoon leader was horrible, absolutely horrible. And she ended up getting relieved before we went in country, thank God, because it was so bad. It was just, it was really bad. Um, and, and so at different points, I have learned lessons both, both, personally, uh, as well as witnessing others of, of how to be a good leader by seeing how to, a bad leader acts and yeah. the kinds of decisions that they make. Well, sometimes those are the best examples. Yeah. Like, uh, truly you're like, mm, I, I definitely, never do I that. don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you yeah. know, that's so wrong, but yeah. it takes you a while to yeah. figure out why is it wrong? What, yeah. what does it mean? Um, you know, I think, there are people that obviously, you know, I, it's, 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 a, it's a batting average too, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's not a hundred percent. Yeah. Like that's, it's, it, they're still human, especially when you have close proximity with, you know, very effective leaders, you know, that this just has a he, she, whomever, not, not meant to 
pronoun it out. Sure. It's just like whomever it is. Yeah. They're not a hundred percent right all the time. Yeah. They're not batting a thousand. Yeah. It's like they're batting six, seven hundred, and you understand that they're fundamentally flawed because we're all human. Yeah. And you accept the fact that this person will make mistakes, but for the most part, they're going to be a very effective leader because they always have your interests or the best interest, the mission, which yeah. is I, I think another important distinction for politics is that the mission success criteria is not bias. Mm -hmm. It's not politically biased. Mm -hmm. It's not read to the left or right. It's basically data driven, yeah. which is we make decisions, we look at the second and third order effects, we develop a course of action and we execute against mission success regardless of whether or not you know, your team leader, team sergeant, your battalion commander is a Democrat or a Republican. Yeah. Like it's a clear differentiation and a high sense of duty. Mm -hmm. um, to, kind of to, your, to, your, uh, to your point about leadership, and I'm thinking about some of the people that, I, that I've respected, it is, it is, I think, for a few reasons, it is about courage, mm -hmm. like we talked about. You know, people who are willing to step out and make the tough decision when playing it safe is probably better for their career. Right. But they're, they're taking that position and actually leading and leading with courage, especially in a combat environment. Mm. Um, but their measure of being a good leader is not only based on mission success and how they make those decisions in the most difficult of environments, but e it is also about how they react when they've made a mistake and when they have, quote unquote, failed. Mm -hmm. And and I have just seen... Um, my respect for people has grown when they have screwed up or they 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 made the wrong call they mm -hmm. made the wrong call and rather than like oh but here's why da, 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 you know justify cover right, my ass right. like all this other shit like yeah i was wrong that was the wrong call here's what we're going to do to fix this and here's what we're going to do to make sure we don't make this same mistake again just taking ownership of it and not trying to deflect right. You know, whether it's an officer saying, oh, well, you know, it's my NCO's fault or whether it's like a platoon sergeant saying like, you know, no, this is this is me, even if it even if it wasn't. And they're they're saying, I'm going to take the arrows for my guys um, because it's my job mm -hmm. as a leader. And and so it's those kinds of things that um, have made more of an impression on me than somebody who may have a stellar record on paper. Um because that to me shows shows character and and similarly the same same attributes apply in politics i imagine the same you know in business as well um earning the respect of of uh you know earning the respect of my soldiers and them taking ownership of me because i took ownership of them right was the best i mean that, that's the best thing that that i think a leader could hope for it's it's weird because there's no there's no prerequisite, right, for somebody to, to run for politics with a background in leadership. Yeah. And, and leadership mm -hmm. is experience-based, but it's also, there's formal training like OCS, Ranger School. Yep. You can go through these blocks of, of leadership. Well, it's it starts, it really it gives starts you tools. in PLDC. It starts yeah. like, you know, taking accountability. You know, yeah. know yourself, know your capabilities, uh, you know, identifying your weaknesses, self-development, yeah. all those exactly. things. Like, they, you start so early. Mm -hmm just pounding it in, you yeah. know, duty. I will not quit my post until properly relieved. Like mm -hmm. duty, just yeah. this sense of duty. Yeah. Most people don't get that type of training to understand what courage, yeah. sacrifice, duty. Mm -hmm. They understand those from the dictionary and what they mean mm -hmm. articulated through words. They don't understand what it means through action. Mm -hmm. And you have to feel those things. You yes. have to have them reinforced and activated through your DNA to truly actually understand what it means. Yeah. Period. Yeah, there's no there's no school for that. Did you get a sense that a lot of the people that you were serving with in Congress did, had no idea how to lead and they were just elected in that position because yes. I, I get mm -hmm. I get a broad sense that Americans are just so disinterested in the politics. Yeah. I mean, yeah. one of the reasons why we end up in the situations either locally or federally is because citizens just like I don't. It's so ugly. I don't want to be involved. Mm -hmm. And like like I just got my ballot in the mail 
and I had talked to you a little bit. You, you were coming in into town to, yeah. to um, back Mike Lee. And I was like, huh, this Mike Lee guy. And I saw him on the ballot. Yeah. So I started doing research. Good. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, oh, he's actually a good candidate, and that's the right guy. Yeah. So I voted for Mike Lee. So when most people get their ballots, because they got everything else in the world going on, especially with the economic issues that mm-hmm. we're facing, all the drama going on yeah. in the world and people's individual lives, they get the ballot and they're just like, whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Who, who cares? Yeah. yeah. And so they're disinterested. So mm-hmm. you know, back to the, the point um, of, of the question, did you get a sense that you were like, surrounded by incompetence of people who didn't understand how to lead in the first place, Probably likely not being able to lead themselves, yes. let alone people. Mm-hmm. Yes. Followers. Yeah. Right. Followers. Yeah. And, peop- and, and therefore looking to, quote unquote, leadership, the people who held mm-hmm. the titles, to provide them with mm-hmm. the direction of where to go and how to vote and what to do, uh, rather than doing the work themselves and recognizing that sense of duty and responsibility that they have not to Nancy Pelosi or whoever the speaker of the house may be, but to their constituents and, and therefore then having the courage when you got to take a tough vote to come home and stand before them and say, you might be angry at me for this vote, but here's why I did it. Mm -hmm. Here's what here, here's the pros and cons that I weighed uh, that drove me to make this decision that I felt was in the best interest of you uh, and and our country. Um, it, it is really disheartening to see how many people who hold these positions of great power and leadership, uh, who are the kind of people who, you know, check the weather vane and see which way the wind is blowing right. and react. And that's that's one of the main problems with, with so much of these decisions that are made is they're reactionary mm-hmm. rather than actually assessing the problem and saying, how do we deal with this underlying issue that's driving all of these problematic symptoms? Mm. Throwing Band-Aids on the symptoms and saying, oh, cool, we did something, uh, and reacting to the headline, then actually doing the tough work and being like, all right, how, how do we actually like fix this so we don't have mm-hmm. to keep coming back? This immigration, for example, is, is a big one that's like, this has been in every election cycle and in so many headlines for as long as I can remember. Yeah. You ask people, what do we do about this? So many of them just like, oh, well, this little thing and that little thing and that little thing, like the system is really broken. The borders are obviously, like that is a huge issue. There are other components of this that are driving um, people surging towards mm-hmm. our borders. There's a foreign policy component to this. There's obviously, you know, Department of Homeland Security component to this. There's so many different levels of this. We could actually solve these problems if people stopped only paying attention to them when when they popped up uh, in the headlines. Mm-hmm. But that's where, sorry, to your, to your point, Mike, about people getting their ballots, because people are getting their ballots across yeah. the country right yeah. now. I think that politics often seems so far away you know, mm-hmm. Washington, like, right. I don't even pay attention to what goes yeah, on in Washington. Yeah. Yep. But as we've seen in states like Virginia, they had their governor's election last year where Democrat yeah. Terry McAuliffe was supposed to win. Mm-hmm. He had like a 10 point lead over the Republican candidate. And then he says, oh, parents, you don't have a right. You don't you don't you yeah. don't get a say in your kids yeah, education. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> a lot of parents paid attention then like say what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, Terry McAuliffe, you get a say the teachers union gets a say. You know, administrators get a say, but I don't get a say about my kids and mm-hmm. what you are teaching them, what kind of values you're instilling in them. Uh, and then coupling that with not just like a concept, but this actual issue. And I've met with a lot of these te- uh, parents in Virginia in the aftermath of this, and they showed me these books that that are in their schools, that it was some of the most sexually graphic images I have ever seen in my life Wow! in a graphic novel directed towards 13 and 14 year old kids. I had heard about it. I was like, oh yeah, that's bad. Right. I held it in my hand and I flipped through a few pages because I, it was so disturbing. It right. was so disturbing. And so when you look at that mentality of like, oh, government's going to raise your kids for you, mm-hmm. parents, you don't actually get a say coupled with w- the way they are trying to raise our kids and the kind of like really dangerous sexualization at such a young age that they're pushing on our kids that gets parents to pay attention. Right. And that really drives home government to like literally your living room and your home. And, uh, and so that's where in that election in Virginia, you know, the Republican was, um, 
Glenn Youngkin was like 10 mm-hmm. points down. Yeah. And within those, that, I think it was like that last month. And by the way, you know, Terry McAuliffe, like they did, he, I don't know, I think he tried to walk it back yeah. or whatever, but yeah, it's yeah. like, dude, you guys have said what you feel. Like you, you actually spoke the truth and revealed, mm-hmm. you know, your, your real belief. Um, but Youngkin ended up winning that election, obviously, but and he won by a couple of points and, and people were like, oh, he barely squeaked by. I was like, no, no. dude won by 12 points because yeah. he was supposed to lose by a lot. And that is the power of our voice when we like, maybe these people weren't going to vote at all. These parents, maybe they weren't going to vote for a Republican for whatever reason, but they saw, wow, this is what this guy, Terry McAuliffe and the Democrats stand for. Hell no. Mm-hmm. We're not going to allow that to happen. And they voted accordingly and uh, their votes are making a difference. They don't just make a difference in the election. It's what happens after the election that matters the most. Mm-hmm. So um, I think more and more this is where there's opportunity because in, so, you know, rising crime, you know, if you're if you're, you don't feel safe with your kids walking down the street anymore, like that's a big issue. Who is the candidate? And I'm not even going to attach this to parties, but who who are the candidates that are focused on these things mm-hmm. and not focused on like some crazy stuff that has nothing to do with reality and that's not important? Right. This is where this is where and how we make a difference. Mm. Yeah, that's good advice for. Mm-hmm. I mean, people just need to get involved. Yeah, I think we've been so not involved for so long, which is one of the reasons we've gotten here because we yeah. haphazardly whether not voting or voting for the wrong people have gotten to this place. Yeah. Now it's time to be conscious and active and go, well, oh, maybe I should kind of look in my backyard and see who yeah. I'm voting for. And it is like, it's not just Congress. Like it's the city councils. Right. Yeah. It's Starts, the boards of education. Yeah. You know, it's your mayor and your sheriff. Yep. yep exactly. Yeah. Uh, because they're, you know, what the choices before us aren't just different flavors of the same ice cream. Right. Like, we're talking about vastly different mm. viewpoints and priorities. Huge extremes. Huge mm. extremes. Mm. And so, uh, yeah, vote your values. Mm. Uh, your your vote matters. Um, it's a free country. This is what it's all about. Uh, you know, we have candidates um, who are dodging debates. Like, well, if they yeah. don't want to talk to you during a debate, they probably already are showing their hand that they are not accountable to you. Might be a sign. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we need more of that. I, I don't understand that system is, like, the best debate would be a podcast. Totally. Right? Curate a podcast and have two people totally. Just debating sides. for hours. Just yeah. throwing yeah. topics. Just conversing. Just throwing exactly. topics yeah. in the middle of the table and saying, hey, what do you think about Unpack this, this yeah. for me. Exactly. There's no time limit on yep. this. We're going to be here. We might be here yep. for six hours. But yeah. at least people will see... You you could you could do that and you could do it really well yeah. and, and just be like it could be called like challenge accepted or something yeah. where it's yeah. just like yeah. the arena mm-hmm. like how incredible would that be because now you get to hear it you get to yeah. hear the debate yeah you know, it's just like everybody asking Joe you know we want these two candidates yeah. I, I saw this meme the other day which I I laughed out loud because it was so funny it was like Joe. And then it was uh, Biden, Trump, Alex Jones, <laughs> and somebody else. He's like the most interesting podcast in the yeah. world, or whatever. Yeah. You know? it's like it's so funny. Um, There's a few pieces of dynamite in yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> like just throwing dynamite yeah. in there. See what happens. Uh, well, thank you so much for your courage, thank your you. leadership. Thank you so much for coming out and being on the show. We thanks really for having it. me. Yeah. I've been looking forward to doing this and it's great to finally be here and hang out with you guys a little bit. No, it's been like a year we've been trying I know. to do this. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's so together. awesome. I, I was just going to say that that's one of the big reasons I respect you is because you're willing to get an interface in long form conversations yeah. Yeah. and have people dig down because there's no secrets. It's yeah. like no. you are who you are and, yeah. and, and I respect that. And I hope, I hope, um, there's an opportunity for you to serve in some capacity because leadership is needed and, and you're needed. I appreciate that. It's, um, you know, it's it was those, you know, in a two hour long presidential debate on average, I got about seven minutes to talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, the political theater and, and just uh, the, the lack of conversation, the lack of interest in discussing real issues. Same thing with cable news. You know, I'll go and I'll take advantage of, of the right. opportunity to go and talk about an issue to bring some sense to the conversation. But, you know, how do you tackle the most important issues of our time in four minutes and 25 seconds? Yeah, yeah you don't. So um, I appreciate being able to come on here and, and talk to you guys. I started my podcast, Tulsi Gabbard Show, for that mm-hmm. reason. 
to be able to have an opportunity to, because I don't fit into anyone's box, mm -hmm. people are like, what, like, who are you? Like, what informs your worldview? Yeah. And that's live right now. It's live oh, now. Awesome. Yeah. Um, we've, we've, uh, um, my next episode is, uh, talking to Congress. It'll drops every Tuesday. Next mm -hmm. episode. Um, I'm not sure when you guys are going to publish this, but, uh, Congressman Steve Scalise is mm -hmm. the, uh, house minority whip right now. He's okay. the number two Republican right. congressman from Louisiana. And, uh, the topic is about second amendment. And he's the guy when he was in the state legislature in Louisiana during Hurricane Katrina, who sued the government for going in, literally going house to house and taking people's guns away, mm. saying this is not constitutional. And uh, so we had a, f and by the way, he was also the guy who was shot and almost killed by a gunman who went to the that, yeah. baseball practice oh, yeah. That's right. in DC. Yeah. He, he was in a coma for days wow. and he lost the equivalent of blood from three entire humans. Whoa. Uh, incredible story. He's got a book. Um, we talk, we talk a lot about that, but, um, we take on, we take on the issue of the second amendment and what does it mean and why is it relevant? And mm -hmm. for me personally, how my own experience growing up in a state like Hawaii, where very restrictive gun laws mm -hmm. to say the least. Um, and being able to, you know, my experience there, my experience in the military and then in, in Congress and what we've seen, especially over the last few years, it has really drilled home for me, um, what every word of the second amendment actually means mm -hmm. both in our right to defend ourselves and our loved ones. The Supreme court ruling on New York's mm -hmm. case, um, had a big impact in, in opening my eyes, but also really, um, how our founders intended the second amendment to be our check on the abuse of power by a tyrannical government. Mm. And when you look at a lot of the policies and I've been very outspoken, um, criticized and, and censored a bit on social media for right. talking about how those in power right now are sh revealing their authoritarian leaning mm -hmm. instincts mm -hmm. and in taking away our right to free speech in saying directly like we're going to form our own version of the ministry of truth and decide what you're allowed to see in here. And there, there are unfortunately a lot of different examples of that, but um, yeah, my conversation with Steve, uh, it was great and I hope it is an opportunity for people, um, people I know personally in my life who um, haven't been exposed to views other than their own right. to think about things hmm. um, and to assess the importance of the Constitution, uh, what the Second Amendment means and its relevance to us in our society at this moment. Awesome. I'll go listen to it. Yeah. yeah I yeah. love it. Where do you find it? Uh, we're Spotify. on everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Great. Tulsi Gabbard show. Uh, it'll be dropping on Tuesday. Awesome. Awesome. Perfect. Cool. Thanks. Tulsi. Thank you. Yep. Good to see you guys. Are you ready to get caffeinated? Well, be on the lookout for Black Rifle Coffee's massive Veterans Day sale. Use code veteran for 20% off site wide at blackriflecoffee.com. It's the perfect time to stop and grab some winter merch and America's best coffee that warms the freedom loving soul. So roll on over to blackrifle.com on Veterans Day and the sale ends on November 13th. That concludes today's training. Any questions? Woo! Drum titties, boy!